So I see we're having some students who are starting to join us here. Um, as we have students joining, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. We know it's evening. Um, maybe you don't have things to do. Maybe you do have other things to do, but we really want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I'm joined here by uh, one of our SOM professors, our School of Management professors, Dr. Cindy Moppin, and uh, she's going to share with us a little bit about leadership, which will be really, really interesting. Um, a couple housekeeping things before we begin. We have turned off the chat, but you are free to ask any questions you may have in our Q&A box, and we will be addressing those at the end. Um, I'll be asking Cynthia some of our more popular questions and we'll also be typing responses on the back side as well. So anytime you have questions, please feel free to uh, put your questions there and we will address them at the end. We'll also be using the polls feature, so we'll be asking questions throughout, um, kind of to keep engaged in the presentation, and you can feel free to ask questions about School of Management in general, all the programs in we have to offer, or anything related to Cynthia's topic, we're happy to talk about each. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Moffin. Hi everyone. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I'm Dr. Cynthia Maupin and uh, I first want to introduce you all to kind of what my area of work is and also what I teach. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everyone so that you can see um, a little bit more about some background information about me and that'll get us kicked off nicely for the night. But thank you all for joining, we really appreciate it. And so the topic uh, that I'd like to cover tonight is talking about developing the leaders of tomorrow and the power of relationships. And the reason that I got into this is based on my own life experience. So I first wanna tell you a little bit about who I am, um, you know, how I got to be at Binghamton and kind of what I'm about. And so I started off actually after my undergraduate career as a leadership consultant, and I traveled all over the country. I lived on an airplane for a long time, um, and I worked with clients um, really from coast to coast trying to help them understand how to be better leaders. And at some point during that process, I learned that you could get a PhD in this kind of stuff, and I thought that that sounded like a really great way to go in a way that I could keep kind of helping people develop, but also help on the teaching and science side as well. And so I got my PhD from the University of Georgia. And then um, during the time at the University of Georgia, I also worked as a researcher with the US Army Research Institute. So um, I've been a lot of different places all over the country and I've had a lot of different experiences. And what's cool about that is it's helped to inform uh, what I'm interested in, how I teach, um, a lot of the examples that I come up with for my students, and then also ultimately ways that I can help my students engage better with leadership and with the world. And so at Binghamton, I'm an assistant professor of leadership and organizational behavior. So I am with the School of Management, and I look forward to you know getting to answer some of your questions about the School of Management as well. Um, I'm also a fellow with the Bass Center for Leadership Studies, which is based out of the School of Management, and they do a ton of work in terms of trying to consult with um, both local businesses and national businesses as well as doing research and grant funding trying to really drive forward what the future of leadership is going to look like and then last I also continue doing some research as a senior fellow for the US Army Research Institute um, again I like to take what I'm learning about on the science side and applying it however I can and the army um, of course has a lot of leadership that they're concerned about as well and so this makes it a great way to kind of make sure I'm, I'm rounding all my corners here. And so to give you a little bit more of an idea of what I do at the School of Management, I teach across all of our levels. I have some classes that are undergraduates, um, some that are for MBA students, and then also some even at the doctoral level, some of our PhD students. And the main topics I teach are individual leadership, team leadership, and social networks. And so you'll see uh, some of the content from that sprinkled throughout tonight's seminar as well, because these are the things that I'm passionate about. This is what I research. And so this is also um, what, I get to share, what I get to share with the students at the School of Management. And so first, before I get into my full seminar topic, I want to learn a little bit more about who we've got with us tonight. So um, I'm going to have uh, Carrie kind of introduce our first poll here, but what brings you 
to this seminar? Is it that you're interested in Binghamton in general? Um, is it that you're specifically interested in the School of Management? Do you just want to learn all about leadership? Or maybe you're just curious, and that's also, uh, you know, a totally valid reason to be here. But we'll give people, you know, a few uh, moments here to go ahead and answer that. We can see lots of results coming in. And then that'll help make sure that as I'm talking through tonight's material, that I can make sure that I'm really focusing on the things that you all care about as well. All right, and it looks like um, we've got a lot of people interested in the School of Management, so that's great. Um, you're definitely in the right place. And then also some of you just kind of interested in understanding Binghamton, some interested in leadership, and others that are just, you know, curious along for the ride. So we'll definitely be answering um, a lot of great questions for you all tonight and also helping you learn a little bit along the way, um, just like my students would in the classroom as well. So bringing us to tonight's topic, I'll be talking about developing the leaders of tomorrow and the power of relationships. And this is really important to me because the students that I'm teaching really will be um, the business leaders of tomorrow. And so part of my mission and goal in the classroom is to make sure that every student that comes through my door has an opportunity to leave it better than they started and to bring some new skills with them. And regardless of what area of management you're interested in, whether that's more on the finance side, um, marketing, or even going straight into leadership and consulting. There's a lot of options, but what I always tell my students is that uh, regardless of where you end up in the business world, chances are you're going to have either a boss and a leader that you have to follow or you yourself will be the boss. So these are all important skills that can help pretty much anybody, um, regardless of your career path, kind of help you reach what that next level is going to be. And so um, I first want to talk about kind of some things you can expect to learn from tonight. So first, we'll be able to distinguish different types of capital. Um, next, we'll also be able to talk about how social relationships can enhance leadership effectiveness broadly. And then we'll also give you some tips and guidance for enhancing your leadership capacity, particularly through some important networking capabilities as well. And so one of the things that's really important in the business world is this idea of capital. And so capital can mean a lot of different things, but broadly speaking, um, as stated by Ron Burt, one of our forefathers in the organizational world, is this idea that people bring things with them into organizations, into this competitive arena. And somehow um, those things that they bring with them, they're able to walk away and have a higher rate of return such that what they brought with them is suddenly better and gives them a competitive advantage advantage in the business world. And so he breaks this into three main types of capital. The first, of course, is probably what most people think about when they think about capital in terms of financial capital, right? So things like cash in hand, um, the ability to get a line of credit with a bank or something, um, having some stock options, investments, and so forth. So this, of course, is important for many, many organizations. Another aspect that businesses care a lot about is their human capital. And so this is all about who their people are, what their people bring with them to the workplace in terms of natural ability. So maybe um, having really intelligent people, maybe having people who are really charming and outgoing, or also this could be in terms of just skills they've learned along the way. So it might be their formal education, it might be some sort of job experience that they've had, um, but all of that is also a source of competitive advantage. And something that is critically important that we're learning is actually um, kind of a hidden piece of this puzzle that a lot of organizations forget about is their social capital. And so the social capital would be more like your friends, your colleagues, the contacts and connections you have both within your organization and outside of it. And these can also be really critical for making sure that a business is successful. And so and thinking about these, if we kind of think about them as like our money and resources, our knowledge and skills, or our relationships and connections, my second poll for you all here uh, to see kind of what your opinion is, what you think is most important is, which of these things do you think is going to matter the most for leadership success? Which of these things do you think is highly critical for a leader to be successful? And there's not necessarily right and wrong answers here. So don't feel like this is a, a quiz or anything. I just want to see what you think is going to be the most impactful. We've got quite a lot of you answering, which is great. Oh, 
Awesome. So as you can see, the results have popped up on your screen too, hopefully. Um, and a lot of you, you know, are coming into this talk informed. Um, so one of the major things we're talking about is the relationships and connections part. And many of you believe that that's going to be what's most critical for leadership success. So you're already on the right path here. Um, but of course, you also need to be able to have resources to be successful. You also need to be able to have good people who have solid skills in order to be successful. So really, you need all three things. But the part that's hardest to understand and hardest to measure are those relationships and connections. And so if we think about these a little bit differently, we can think about those three categories as our financial capital, our human capital, and also our social capital. And of course, for tonight's talk, um, the most important, or at least the one that we're going to focus on the most, is going to be social capital, really trying to understand how social connections matter. And so, again, going back uh, to Bert here, he mentioned kind of some of the early ideas about social capital and why that might be important for organizations and for leaders to be successful. And so he talks about how having a network of contacts is important within businesses, that certain people are connected to certain others, they might trust some people more than others, they might have some sort of obligation to other people or a dependence with other people, and so that can matter in terms of um, um, having some sort of competitive advantage and then also um, thinking about the structure of someone's network and also the location of where their contacts are in that structure can be what translates into that competitive advantage and makes it so that the organization itself has a higher return on investment. So this is all good from a business perspective. You want to have the right people in the right places and in particular you want your leaders to be um, well connected within and between organizations. And so when we're thinking about social capital, a really easy way to describe this is just thinking about social relationships that help you be either effective as an individual, um, help your team to be effective, or maybe even your entire organization. And when we think about social capital and why it's so hard to measure, one of the reasons that is, is that it's hard to measure um, whether or not a relationship exists, right? And so what we do is we translate this into something called a social network, which helps us to graphically display what different social connections look like between individuals, groups, and organizations. And so in this sense, um, this is kind of a, you know, small depiction of a potential social network. And what it shows is who all the different people are within the organization and the lines between them show which relationships exist. And so we can examine social capital within organizations by looking at these different social network patterns and using those to make meaningful inferences about um, who's meaningful, who has access to resources, and who's going to help really get work done within the organization. And so some of my earlier work is really interested in understanding how we translate this idea into the leadership context. And so in particular, we find that leaders need to be able to understand social networks. And so that means they need to know um, how their own social connections look, who all is in their network, um, and who they need to strengthen relationships with. They also need to understand the social connections of others, um, particularly if they are the leader of a team. They need to understand the connections between the team members that they lead. They also need to be able to understand how they might be able to alter social connections. So how can they get their team to be more cohesive, to have more connectedness, or how can they help people on their team make connections and bridges to other teams? And all of this helps to facilitate the larger goals of the organization. And so it's critical that leaders are able to think in terms of social networks and also be able to make sure their own social network is robust. And so here's a quick example to kind of illustrate a little bit what we mean about this. And so as you can see here on the left side of the screen, we have what we would consider to be a formal hierarchy and an organization. And so this really looks just like a map of who reports to who, right? So you can see we've got our senior vice president at the top. We've got various department directors below him, and then we've got people within teams below them. And so when we look at that formal structure, we would assume that likely the 
person who's in charge of all of the work who helps get the most done is going to be that senior vice president just based on the way the organizational chart is created. However, we see on the right over here that there's informal relationships connecting all of these people together, potentially in ways that are different from the formal structure. And that's really critical to understand because a lot of the real work in organizations is actually done through this informal network and not necessarily through the formal hierarchy and chain. And so in this case, we might assume that Senior Vice President Jones is going to be the person again to really drive things in the organization. But we find in this informal network that actually Cole, who on the left side seems like a completely unimportant person, they're just a direct report all the way at the bottom of the chain. This person is actually who's connecting everybody else in the organization together, helping them to exchange information with one another and helping them to get work done. And so in comparison, Jones only has connections to two people. Cole has connections to something like seven or eight people. And so if you really need to have something accomplished, making sure it goes through Cole is going to be one of the most effective ways to do so. So leaders need to be able to understand these kinds of relationships and know when they need to be leveraging different ones in order to be more effective. And so one of the major ways that future leaders can help to do this is by learning how to manage their own network connections. And the challenge here is that a lot of people hear the terms, you know, networks or networking, and there's a lot of misconceptions that come along with that. There's a lot of negative feelings that people might have. Um, there's a lot of ways that people feel intimidated by networking. And in fact, um, a lot of these things that people assume about networking are myths. And so the first step here to making yourself a more effective leader within a network type of system is in overcoming some of those network myths. And then second, um, it's learning how to enhance your networking capabilities. So once you've moved past understanding which myths are kind of uh, mythical, really, and which ones um, are the realities of networking, then you can learn to become a more effective networker and a more effective leader. And so um, a paper by Anand and Conger disentangle some of the networking myths versus networking realities. And so the first myth they've identified by interviewing um, many CEOs with a bunch of different companies is that the best networkers are quote unquote born that way, that that's some sort of natural ability that they have. And if you weren't born that way, you don't have it. And in fact, we find that effective networkers are actually people who've developed this as a skill and it's something they've worked hard to do. And it's not something that they were just instantly born with. And so this means also that networking is something that anybody can become better at. It's not something that you just have to have a natural talent for. The second myth is that effective networkers are mostly just self-interested. They're only looking out for themselves. And in fact, we find that people who are good networkers are aware of all of the expectations of other people and connections that they have within their network. And they realize that if they're only prioritizing their own outcomes, that's actually going to hurt their ability to be a good networker. People aren't going to want to work with them. They're not going to want to help them. And so by being someone who is um, worried about everyone's interests in their network and not just their own, that also helps you to be a much more effective uh, networker. The third myth they identify is that networkers carefully guard the networks that they've built. And in fact, um, some of the most successful networkers are actually people who don't think of their network as theirs at all. And in fact, they're constantly focusing on building up the relationships of people around them. And it's almost like a happy accident that they end up rebuilding their network even stronger. So by empowering others, that's actually where they end up getting some of the most robust networks. And then last, um, our fourth myth here is that networkers constantly keep in touch with all the people they know. So some people are turned off by networking because they assume oh, I could never balance that many relationships. It's too many people. But in fact, most effective networkers are also pressed for time, just like any of us. And they worry about maintaining connections with people when they can, but they don't keep in touch with everybody. They deactivate and activate different relationships as needed. And because they are good friends to each of these people in their network, it's okay that they're not always keeping up with them all the time. And so the next question I kind of like to get some feedback from you guys on is trying to understand which of these realities was most surprising to you. So based on what you knew about networking or what you thought about networking before this, which of these things seems the most shocking to you or something that um, goes contrary to what you might have expected? And so we'll give people a few moments here to kind of think through what these were and also answer which one they think is the most surprising. 
All right, we got a lot of people answering. This is great. All right, awesome guys, things are looking good. So um, hopefully you all can also see the poll results on your screen, but it looks like the majority of you identified um, the third reality is the one that was most surprising, this idea that a network isn't just for the networker, um, but it's also something that they focus on building for other people around them and empowering others. And then it looks like everybody already knew that an effective networkers work hard, so that part's good. And then there's a few of you sprinkled between number two and number four, so. Um, excellent job, everyone, uh, and I'm glad that you're hopefully learning along the way, too. These are some things that a lot of people kind of uh, take as fact, when in reality, um, networking can actually be something that's attainable for any of us. And so, um, when we think about how to improve our networks, there's four main capabilities that help people to become more effective networkers. So hopefully each of you can kind of think about each of these capabilities and how you might be able to apply them in your own life. For the students that I work with, um, what we really talk about in terms of this first networking capability is that you want to make sure that you're seeking out the kingpins in each situation that you're a part of, whether that's at your work, in a volunteer sense, whatever the case may be, it's really helpful to find who that person is that's well trusted and well respected within a group and forming connections with them. And this doesn't necessarily mean it's the CEO or the boss or the formal leader of that group by any means. And in fact, usually, um, if we think back to our example, it's someone like Cole who doesn't necessarily have a formal title, but is helping everybody else get work done within their group. And so we found throughout history that this tends to be a highly effective networking strategy. And in fact, um, for any of you who have heard of Cosimo de' Medici. Um, he was a highly adept networker in his day and in fact one of the reasons that historians think he was so effective at networking was because he could so easily identify these kingpins that everybody else was overlooking in all these different groups. Our next networking capability is um, talking about the part and the realities where you are working on helping other people and their networking as well. And so our second network one to do matchmaking to get things done focuses on having um, connections that you make between people who have complementary needs and abilities. And so if you find out that one person is looking for a particular skill and you know you have another friend who has that skill by connecting them to together and building their relationship ties with one another, you can help them do what they need to do, but then they also um, feel, you know, like they've gotten a positive benefit from being a part of your network and they're more likely to help you in the future. So by actively helping others to kind of reach out and develop their networks, you ultimately end up bringing people together and also end up making your network even stronger. And so to think about this, you can think about how you can help others build connections and by helping build their social capital, that ultimately ends up enhancing your own social capital. So it ends up being a win-win for everybody in that sense. Our third networking capability is called enhancing networks continuously. And so this one is what it sounds like, um, but making sure that you're constantly meeting new people, increasing the size of your network, um, also working on not just meeting new people, but strengthening the relationships the relationships that you already have with people in your network is also important. And then also making sure that your network contacts are diverse. So you're not only friends and having connections with people who are peers, but you have some people who are mentors and some other people that you mentor. Um, you don't only have connections with people from one group, but you have connections across a whole bunch of groups. Um, and so this can be really helpful. And a lot of CEOs in particular have worked on developing this capability. And so an example of this would be whenever David Simon took over um, for BP. And in part of doing this, he wanted to make sure that the changes he was making were being effectively carried out throughout his organization. So rather than only talking to the same people over and over again, he created network ties with the people who were on the front lines of the organization, including the chauffeurs, the catering staff, to see how different decisions were impacting across the entire organization. And that helped him be a much more effective leader to make sure all of his decisions were actually playing out in a good way um, throughout the company and not just benefiting a few people that he knew at the top of the organization. 
And then last but not least, um, our fourth networking capability is just generally interacting amiably with others. And what we mean by that is just being friendly, being someone who gets along with people. And so if you leave others with the impression that you are interested in listening to their concerns, um, you want to develop interests with them outside of the workplace, maybe you have something of a social relationship, not just a formal work relationship, or even doing things to reduce kind of the formality and hierarchy within an organization, all of these things can show that you're interested in actually just getting to know people and be, being friendly with them. And so this is well portrayed by Southwest Airlines CEO. Um, and in fact, many of his employees talk about how he cares about them as just people also and friends, not just as workers for the airline and what they do um, on their nine to five kind of jobs. And so by being someone who is just generally friendly and gets along well with everyone, it's also helped him to be a much more effective leader. And he also has the ability to get information and input from people all across the entire organization instead of just from the same voices over and over. And so in summary here, our four tips for enhancing our networking success are seeking out the kingpin, so those informal leaders, um, matchmaking to get things done, so putting together people who might benefit from knowing one another, enhancing our networks continuously, getting to know people, and also strengthening our existing connections, and then last, just being friendly and making sure that you're making a good impression on people around you. And so in thinking about what we've learned in total today, um, as I mentioned, these are some of our learning outcomes here, but we've learned about what the three different kinds of capital are. Um, we've also learned about how social relationships can help leaders to be more effective, and in particular, that informal connections and organizations are critically important. And then also, um, by utilizing those different networking capabilities, you can enhance your leadership capacity and improve your network so you don't have to buy buy into those networking myths. And in fact, um, you can all become better leaders by understanding how these social relationships exist and ultimately how you can improve them. So um, I want to thank you all for your time and attention and for um, also participating in our different polls throughout the presentation. And now um, we're going to go ahead and start off with some questions. And I have my email here as well in case you have questions that you just want to, you know, email me directly at some point. But otherwise, I think we'll be going through the Q&A system um, with Carrie. So I look forward to answering some of your questions and um, hearing what you guys thought. Thank you so much, Dr. Mockin. Um, so we actually do have one question here and um, any attendees who will have other questions, whether it's about the leadership topic or about SOM, you can feel free to ask them in the Q&A. Um, so the first question we have is, um, to your knowledge, how much of the SOM's undergraduate curriculum is based on technical skills, so working with statistical and quantitative skills versus soft skills like leadership strategies and the study of organizational behavior? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in part, it's going to depend on what your concentration is. So for those people who are interested in um, some of the more statistics based kinds of inter uh, a concentration. So anybody who's looking at management information systems, um, supply chain, finance, they're going to have a little bit more of a focus on the data side, on the statistics side, because that goes with that area of understanding. And then what's been happening across the school broadly over the past few years that we're very proud of is that we're all making the move towards being more quantitatively focused so that regardless, um, because the world has been changing, there's a lot more of a focus on big data, even in things like the leadership world world, we're incorporating different ways of understanding different quantitative methodologies, even in what most people would consider to be the um, softer parts of the school in terms of like leadership and consulting and so forth. And so um, the focus for us tends to be on making sure that you understand the numbers and that you're able to analyze them and draw conclusions from them because when you go out into the business world, that's a critical part of it. And even again, if you're a leader, um, it doesn't mean that you're totally divorced from the day-to-day -day of an organization, right? You still need to understand how a lot of that works. And so I don't have an exact percentage or anything off the top of my head, but it is incorporated heavily into the curriculum, and it is something that uh, we want to make sure that everyone coming out of the school age management is prepared for, because for the future workforce, that's what we need. Um, but again, there will be, depending on your concentration, maybe a little bit more of a focus or a little bit less of a focus. So there can be a little bit of a, you know, choose your own adventure there too. Great question. 
Great, thank you. Um, and we have another, a uh, little bit of a broader question here. What are the different concentrations within SOM? So maybe you can kind of explain how SOM works, how the systems work, and a um, little bit about those different concentrations. Yeah, so we have two kind of big overarching umbrellas. Um, we have our accounting umbrella, which is a lot of accounting, as you can, man as you can imagine. And then um, under business administration, we have a bunch of different concentrations. And so I hope I catch them all. Um, but we have under business administration, there's leadership and consulting, which is the one that I work within usually, I'm in the most familiar with. Um, we also have management information systems or MIS, um, which you may have also heard of. We have supply chain management as well. Um, finance falls under us as well. Then there is marketing and there's a quantitative, oh, quantitative finance is now, they're all combined together just under finance. Um, and then also entrepreneurship. So there's a wide variety of different options. And I know too, um, if you've had a chance to go through like the School of Management website, each of those has a deeper description about what kinds of courses are incorporated under them, what types of requirements there are as well. So of course the requirements for each is gonna be slightly different because you're going to have different courses if you're concentrating in something like accounting versus something like leadership and consulting. But at the, um, you know, and the part that makes it all easy is that we do have a lot of advisors on hand who are constantly making sure, you know, everybody has their questions answered. Nobody's unsure about what course requirements they need in order to graduate with whatever the, their particular goals are. So um, you've got a lot of options, right? But it's not necessarily, oh, and I think um, we've sent out a link as well. Perfect. Um, but it's a, you know, there's a lot of variety and then people are able to kind of try out different things and see what they like most. And some of our students even will have multiple concentrations if there are things that click with them from multiple different angles. So I know some of my leadership and consulting folks um, are also interested in like supply chain and also interested in management information systems. We've got some accounting people who also want to specialize in leadership. So there's a lot of flexibility within the school. Perfect. Um, so kind of a, a segue from that, we have uh, Sarang, one of our attendees, is asking what would be the outcomes for the different majors? So you kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, and I guess in, in, in conjunction with that, what opportunities for networking do students have at School of Management? So, you know, how do they come out from that? And I think speaking of networking and the topic, those are maybe two good questions to answer together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll start with the outcomes part. Um, so a lot of our students who are interested interested in accounting do tend to go work at the big accounting firms in New York City. Um, and so depending on how competitive the students are and also whether they're part of the PwC program and so forth, they might have different types of firms that they gravitate towards. But a lot of our accounting students do end up then passing the CPA exam and going on to be accountants. Um, our finance students, a lot of them end up doing some financial analysis types of roles within businesses or um, some of them go and are working in terms of like investments, trying to understand that side of the business world. Um, our marketing folks end up working in different marketing firms, either as a specialized firm or as a um, kind of role within another type of organization. So you might be the marketing person at an accounting firm, for example. Um, our leadership folks, a lot of them end up going into different types of leadership consulting roles. They do get a lot of experience with that within our program as well. So they come out already having some contacts within the um, broader business world, again, particularly in New York City, but also in other places locally around Binghamton too. And then um, for our supply chain folks, a lot of them are interested in trying to understand how you can make it all the way through from like production all the way to delivery, how you're going to be able to get products out to consumers. And so again, that is usually embedded within some sort of um, organizational role. You might work within the supply chain group of an organization. And then I'm going to try to see if I'm missing anybody here. Um, that might be all of our ones. It's possible I've forgotten something in there. The important part, though, and I think particularly, again, relevant to what we talked about today is our topic is the networking component. And so as many of you who are interested in the School of Management know, and also as we talked about today, networking is a critical component of student success. And so we make a concerted effort to make sure that students have a lot of exposure to people within the professional world throughout their time in the School of Management. And so 
We have speakers come in who are representatives of the big accounting firms. We have case competitions where people who are serving as judges on those competitions are also people working in the broader business world. We have business leaders come into our classroom so that students can meet them one on one, have panels and ask them questions. Um, and then also many of our faculty just in general are broadly connected to a lot of different organizations. So I myself come from a consulting background, so I have a bunch of business connections. Um, um, not only in New York, but also in places like Atlanta and LA and Chicago. Um, a lot of the faculty, everyone kind of comes in with a different background, but we all make sure that we're connecting students with those professional connections that they need in order to be successful. And the great part on our end is that the students who come through the School of Management are impressive. And so because of that, it makes it really easy for us to make those connections to our professional contacts because we know at the end of the day that we're making great uh, recommendations for those organizations. So um, we've been very fortunate in that and we look forward to also having new classes of students coming in who can continue to keep that excellent reputation for us. Great, thank you. Um, another couple of questions, I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, can you mention some of the specific benefits of the PwC program or kind of just how that works and kind of explain a little bit more within the context of SOM? Yeah, so the PwC program um, selects some of the top students within the School of Management who are interested in accounting in particular. And so with this program, some people are able to um, apply and be accepted right away as freshmen. Otherwise, you can also apply during the second half of your freshman year to be admitted into the program as a sophomore. And the students who are in this program get additional access to a lot of great opportunities sponsored in part by PwC. And so they usually have an international trip that they get to go on. Um, they have the opportunity for being involved in various case competitions that get them a lot of face time with a lot of the big four firms. And then they also have their own advising where they get one-on-one -on -one mentoring and um, the ability to make sure that they're able to ask questions of other students who've gone through the program to make sure that they're getting, you know, the, the right classes at the right times in order to be able to be as competitive as possible once they get out onto the job market. And in general, the program itself is extremely well run. Um, one of our faculty members, she has made sure that this program has kind of grown and flourished, particularly over the past five years or so. And so a lot of our students in that program end up being the most competitive people on the, on the market when they're trying to get jobs. So it's a really great program and it takes kind of the people who are already amazing and helps them reach stellar status. So they've been very successful. And um, I know several of the students I've worked with have really loved what they've gotten out of the program because they feel like the additional opportunities they got just helped them make the difference and be that much more confident when it came time to turn around and, you know, join the business world itself. Great. Um, so we also have some questions here about how early the internships begin within the School of Management. So maybe you could walk us through what, you know, a kind of sample curriculum might look like for a student. What, you know, what they're going to look at their first and second years when those internships are going to begin and then, you know, how it's going to look as, as they approach their fourth year. Sure, absolutely. So I know some students, again, take things slightly differently. We have some students who come in with credits, some who are um, starting fresh with Binghamton as well. So it's going to vary a little bit. But in general, what we tend to see is the first year students are taking more of the um, kind of broader education requirements. And then starting in their sophomore year, if they haven't already started some of these classes as a freshman, they have the opportunity to take what's called our s -Core. Um So it's for the sophomore course classes and they set that up intentionally to make sure that the students who are able to um, kind of come in are able to get into the business classes as soon as possible and start learning what those core concepts are and that also gives students an opportunity to make sure that they are in the right concentration, in the right type of program that they really like what they're learning. And then after going through the s -Core, um, some students will go ahead and get an internship after their sophomore year, depending again on um, how well they've been performing and whether they've had a chance to make some of those connections. And so if a student is highly performing and they're doing great in classes, it's not surprising to see people have those sophomore year internships. But then the more typical route is that people after going through their J-Core, their junior core courses, 
um, during their junior year where they're getting into even more specialized courses for their concentration. Then frequently they'll do the internship the summer after their junior year so that by the time they're graduating as a senior, they've already made a connection with an organization. Um, most of our students also end up with full-time job offers after that internship summer. So they'll have the opportunity to um, work somewhere as a junior and then they're just finishing up their last few pieces of coursework so that they're ready to hit the workforce running as soon as they graduate. And then from there, um, you know, some students also stick around and do the MBA program. Some just immediately go out into the business world. So there's going to be some variety and some variance there, but there's a lot of guidance in terms of making sure that you're taking the right courses at the right times. And we also make sure that our courses are, um, you know, offered in a way that what you're learning from one semester builds on that the next semester. So that at no point do you feel like you're taking classes just to take them. They all end up being important and kind of leading into the next one so that by the time you're having to make uh, decisions about really what it is you want to do with your life, you're well informed and you've had an opportunity to become familiar with different areas of the school before making that commitment, but then you also get really specialized knowledge within that area before you graduate. So um, it tends to be a really productive kind of program for our students and we find that a lot of the organizations that our students join are thankful for the types of content that they get while they're at the School of Management because a lot of them come in knowing the majority of what they need to in the business world instead of having to be kind of caught up along the way. Thank you. Um, so you also mentioned just at the end of that uh, topic here how some students kind of end up finding what they want to do and, and going that route by the end. Um, so one of our students is asking, is it better to take a particular major or is it okay to take just, you know, general management through SOM and, you know, maybe what are the advantages of that? Sure. So you can start with the general management type of degree. That's totally okay. You still have the opportunity to try out different classes and different concentrations and see what really clicks with you and what's something that you find particularly um, exciting and important. But then uh, at the end of your career, it does help to have some sort of specialization when you're going out into the job world because you'll be able to say that you do have that specialized knowledge and expertise for whatever that area is. So um, you have the opportunity to be a generalist if you want to, to learn broadly across a bunch of areas, but you'll be able to be um, the most effective in a particular career if by around like junior year and particularly by senior year you've kind of figured out and narrowed down what are the one or two main topics that you find really interesting and really inspiring. And then from there, because you'll be getting so much specialized knowledge, again, you're ready to hit the ground running once you graduate. Um, there are people who take different routes. And so there's, again, not necessarily like one correct way to do it. Um, but in terms of making sure that you're able to take that in-depth dive and have a little bit of specialization does help eventually if you are able to kind of declare which direction you'd like to go. Thank you. Um, so we have a student here who, um, who's mentioning law school and I know we have the pre-law track. So for students who are planning to go to law school, what networking opportunities exist within the larger New York City law firms or, you know, are there any opportunities at SOM's internship fairs? And maybe you can talk about some of those New York City opportunities because I know there is a center and a hub down there as well. Yeah, yeah. And so I know they make a lot of concerted efforts to bring people in um, from the city to the school so that you have the opportunity opportunity to meet um, people from the different firms as well and a lot of our students do end up doing both some sort of law degree and also um, within management as well so that's definitely a pathway that's a possible one and one that a lot of our students really appreciate um, and again, it's um, making sure that you're going to the various career fairs that we offer, um, making sure that you're taking the opportunity to reach out to people when they're in town to be speakers for various events. Those tend to be some of the best ways that our students make connections because they can get their um, name to be familiar to these different firms before they've even applied. And then by doing so, they have the opportunity to be someone familiar um, in the pile of applications as opposed to just being another face in the crowd at that point. So there's a lot of opportunities for making sure that you're getting to build those connections. Um, and also, again, faculty make a concerted effort to try to facilitate those as much as possible so that we can make sure that, again, our students are being placed well once they graduate from us. Great. Um, and so we do have some questions here as well about your thoughts on the five year. Um, this question is about the accounting program in particular, but maybe you can touch a little bit more on just all of the five year programs that S <laughs> offers and just a brief overview of kind of what, what those opportunities might look like and how they might help students. 
Sure. So um, we're finding that a lot of people really appreciate being the, having the opportunity to stick around Binghamton and continue to finish up a graduate degree of some sort. And so some people do that um, with a master's in accounting, some people do that with an MBA, um, and then some people will do that in various forms of the MBA. So if you are someone who is a business major and you have gone through Binghamton, then we have our four plus one program, which a lot of our students really love because they have the opportunity to finish up their graduate work in one year after being here as an undergraduate. So um, they're able to kind of accelerate their ability to enter into the workforce, but already come in with that advanced degree, which can be really helpful. And then we also have some students who are coming into Binghamton from outside of Binghamton. And so if they've already got some sort of business degree, then they can also take advantage of an expedited program so that they're able to basically say, you know, I'm already from an accredited university. I already have my degree in business. I understand this background information and now I just want to expand on that with this additional graduate work. So that's another option. Um, we also have some students who come in for our two-year MBA program who are just relearning business entirely. Maybe they did something completely different as an undergrad and they're just really interested in kind of making that transition over to the business world. And so we have opportunities for people to kind of do a more extensive program if they would like to, to learn um, a little bit more about that kind of background knowledge first before they dive into some of the more specialized programs within our MBA program. And then um, the accounting program itself also makes sure that there's a, an additional way that students can stick around and get even more specialized kind of learning and expertise in particular so that they're able to excel on the CPA exam. I know that that's a big pressure for a lot of our accounting students. They want to make sure that they do well and place well. And so people can also stick around and do the master's in accounting that way. So there's a variety of different programs and um, they're all super successful in terms of having great students come in and then also having great student placement after the fact. So for a lot of people, it ends up being, especially if they're just going to do, um, you know, tacking on another year to their already, you know, undergrad degree that they've done with us, it ends up being really effective because they're able to continue and pick up right where they left off and make sure that they're getting that specialized expertise right away. And then they go out into the business world already having that advanced degree that enables them to kind of, uh, progress through the chain more quickly. So a lot of positions will want you to have some sort of graduate education before taking on higher level leadership roles. And so they have the opportunity to join those um, sorts of roles sooner than they would if they had to come back and then try to go back into the business world again. So again, there's no right way to do it. There's no wrong way to do it. A lot of our students just choose whatever ends up being most effective for their stage in school, the kind of background they have, and then ultimately um, what their sorts of career goals end up being too. Perfect. Um, so then we have a couple more specific questions here. Um, one question is, can you decide to be an accounting major with a concentration in something listed under business administration? And I know you kind of briefly touched on that, but we talk a little bit more about the multiple majors versus you know, multiple concentrations and that sort of thing. Sure. So um, in doing multiple concentrations all within the business administration side, it's a little bit easier just because the class load is going to be overlapping a bit more just because it's all under the same larger umbrella. We do, however, have students who do want to do both a concentration um, from the management side, but then also have the accounting degree. And so there's going to be some additional coursework there because you will have specialized courses on each side that you'll need to get through in order to make sure that you're qualified in both areas. But it's something that a lot of our students find um, useful and interesting. And so it's definitely not an impossible task. And it's something that we just encourage those students to make sure that they've got a plan that they've worked on with their advisor so that they're hitting each of the milestones that they need to and getting to the right classes at the right time so that when they're trying to finish their degree, all the boxes are checked, everything is good to go. Um, so we do encourage students to be able to have those opportunities where they can kind of, you know, be a part of multiple things as well. Um, but again, you know, you just want to be careful to make sure that you understand all of the requirements um, of those programs, that everything is translating well across them, and that the timing for classes works out. But all of our advising staff are super happy to help figure that out. And again, it's something that we do commonly for our students, so it wouldn't be much of a stretch. 
Perfect. Okay, and we've got a great wrap-up question here. Um, so our, one of our students, Nicole, thank you for this question. Um, how do you think Binghamton School of Management is different from undergraduate, other undergraduate business schools? And um, kind of wrapped within that, we have questions about what kind of clubs within SOM or organizations, I know there's some professional fraternities that they can join. So mm -hmm. just what sets SOM apart from other undergraduate business schools and what kind of opportunities exist at Binghamton that may not at other institutions? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and it's one that uh, I'm always proud to answer. So at Binghamton, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is making sure that we put our students first and making sure that they're getting the education they need and the opportunities that they need to be successful. We know that first and foremost, we're here for the students, um, and so we want to make sure that everybody coming in our door leaves it much better than they started and has the opportunity to get those high-level jobs that they're looking for. And so rather than just being, you know, another face in the crowd, Binghamton we're big enough that there's um, you know a variety of people it's not like you see the same 10 faces all the time but it's also small enough that I run into my students on campus constantly um, I keep up with them on a professional level even after they've left my classroom to make sure if there's anything I can do to help them that I'm able to connect them to people that I know or that I'm able to help you know answer even professional questions after the fact and so many of our students like keeping in contact with our faculty and our advising staff um, and make really strong connections while they're here that they may not have the opportunity to do at other schools, particularly um, much larger schools where you're just kind of a, you know, a face among millions. Um, around here, we all know each other and we care about each other. And so we also make sure that everything we do in terms of the types of classes we're teaching, the types of curriculum we're offering, um, even the kinds of program requirements that we're looking for, we're doing all of these things with our students in mind to make sure that Binghamton remains one of the most competitive on the job market so that our students continually have high placements and then that you know cycle kind of continues our alumni love to come back and share their success stories and then also help connect um, with our current students to make sure that they're helping introduce them into the workforce the same way someone did that for them and so I know one of the major pushes we have is that a lot of our students who have gone into um, various programs particularly organizations within New York City a lot of them want to keep in touch Touch. A lot of them want to understand, you know, who else might be interested in roles with their organization and they will reach out to us to make sure that we're giving um, kind of our recommendations for our best students to them directly so that our students have the continued opportunity to have the strong legacy in terms of making sure that again they're working in the top firms and getting the top positions and so that's one thing that I think is unique here um, and something that would be different from a lot of schools where there's just kind of, you know, the SEP curriculum, everything is just kind of cut and dry and they're churning students in and kind of seeing them on their way. Around here, we want to make sure that everybody feels like they're being treated individually and for what's in their best interest, not just, you know, having another face in the crowd by any means. And then um, in terms of understanding one of the ways that we do that, we have a lot of ambassadors with the different firms, um, and particularly again in New York City, who will be again alumni who are connecting with our current students to make sure we have on campus ambassadors and also at the organization ambassadors. So the students who are about to go join some of the big firms um, will be kind of the on campus representative to talk about what their experiences were like in terms of the internship. And they'll talk with students who are considering those different options, giving them a realistic pre view of what it would be like so that when everyone is trying to apply for internships and take that next step they know exactly what kind of organization um, they want to work for and what kind of people have already been there from Binghamton so it makes the transition much easier for them than it would be from a lot of places and then we also again have um, a lot of different honor fraternities that students get involved in to give them additional leadership opportunities so that they are able to kind of practice some of these things that we talk about in class particularly in my classes, um, they can practice those in these student organizations so that by the time they get out into the business world, they're polished and they're professional and they know how to be um, effective business people out in the world. They're not just, you know, any other student who's joining. And then um, in terms of the different ones, I'm probably going to blank on them off the top of my head, but um, we have lots of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities depending 
depending on what kind of group of people you're looking for, if there's a particular um, topic or concentration that you're most interested in. We've got some that are, again, more accounting based, some that are more um, business administration based. There's a wide variety, but there's also at the beginning of every year, we have a big um, fair for the, the School of Management um, for all of our new incoming students. All of our student organizations have tables around the outside and um, we meet together as a school to talk about what our accomplishments have been. Um, we also talk about where we're headed in the future in terms of our strategic plans for the school and then we want to welcome all of our new students and introduce them to those people who are veteran members of all the student organizations. So at no point does any student have to go searching on their own to figure out this stuff. We make sure that each step of the way um, you have an opportunity to meet with people, build those connections, develop them, and then ultimately in future years those students are the ones that are helping recruit um, brand new students to join their organizations at that same event. So um, this is something that we try to make as easy as possible so that our students are able to get involved, get involved right away should they like to, and then grow as much as they can before they, they leave us into the real world. Great. Thank you so much. I think this has been a wonderful opportunity for our students to get to know more about SOM and um, your talk on leadership was, was certainly really helpful as well. Um, I'm sure for all attending and there'll be plenty of students who watch this back as well. So I want to thank all of our students who have stayed on for the whole time. I hope that we've answered plenty of your questions um, and you can feel free to watch this back. It should be up on our website within the next couple of weeks and we hope to see a lot of you here at Binghamton in the fall. Um, thank you again Dr. Maupin for taking the time and um, we really appreciate everyone who joined us so we hope everyone has has a great evening and, and thanks again for joining us thank you Dr. Maupin and uh, we'll hope to see everyone soon thanks everyone